Good evening. It's 6 p.m. on Wednesday. We are at Jesus is Lord Ministries International, located just west of Gettysburg. And tonight's message is called Spiritual Gifts for Believers. That would be believers in Jesus Christ. Last week, the last two or three weeks ago, we spoke on the ministry leadership gifts given to the church. There was a general teaching, and then we had a specific one on what the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher of today should look like. The New Testament offices. And then we started last week on spiritual gifts for believers. And this week, we're going to specifically look at those gifts. I'm going to open us in prayer, and then we will get into... I don't know if I can finish this all in one message, because we're going to spend a lot of time on wisdom tonight. But Father, I thank you for the opportunity to stand behind this pulpit. Lord, I do not take this opportunity lightly. And as I speak the message that you put forth on my heart in preparation to go and teach other nations this material, I thank you that your words will not return void. And Lord, I submit to you today, to the Holy Spirit, let words of knowledge, words of wisdom flow freely. The, I give the Holy Spirit the freedom to move in this service, and I submit myself to you. So let the gifts flow this evening as this message goes forth. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. The message title tonight again is Spiritual Gifts for Believers. It's important that we understand the source or the originator of the gifts. Now, next week, if the Lord permits me, the message title will be called Every Good Gift. Now, we have the gift of salvation, and all things that pertain unto life and godliness are found in the Word of God, which is a gift. John chapter 3, verse 16. We have the ministry leadership gifts for the church, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And tonight, we're continuing on spiritual gifts for believers. Every good gift. Now, spiritual gifts for believers, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've been really studying 1 Corinthians for well over a month now, and if you want to look at a title for a message, if you had, if, you, if the title was called The Work of the Holy Spirit, you could actually have five parts of an outline. The Holy Spirit in relation to creation and revelation, the Holy Spirit in relation to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit in relation to the church, the Holy Spirit in relation to individual believers, and the Holy Spirit in relation to sinners, the work of the Holy Spirit. Now that's what we're talking about tonight, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, Paul's first the first epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians, chapter 12. We're continuing in chapter 12. Now these spiritual gifts, I'm going to repeat many terms throughout tonight, and it's, it's not to bore you, it's to get these deep into your mind so that you can move it into your heart. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the spirit of wisdom, understanding, and revelation in the knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
that our eyes, the eyes of our enlightenment, are opened to understanding the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. These gifts, and we're going to speak about nine of them, and then if the Lord allows me next week, I'll continue with two others, uh, 10 and 11. But what we typically refer to as the gifts of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, I'm going to give those to you in a minute, but it's very important that you understand these are divine, supernatural gifts or manifestations of God's power and glory. These are not, it's not human wisdom, it's not human knowledge. It's divine, they're divine supernatural gifts given to a believer, to believers, for the edification of other believers, for the whole body of Christ. Now, these, these gifts that they were all intended for one and the same general end, they were intended to advance for the advancement of Christianity, the ministry of Jesus Christ, and for the church's edification. Now, I want to give you a definition before we get into the individual gifts. The word edification... The definition of that word is a building up in a moral and religious sense. Instruction, improvement, and progress of the mind in knowledge, in morals, or in faith and holiness. Now, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's part of the definition of edification. Progress of the mind, or you could say the washing of the water by the washing of water of the Word. Now, these are extraordinary. We already looked at what I would call the offices of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor and teacher, and powers for conviction of unbelievers and the propagation of the gospel. Power, the gospel, power unto salvation. Now, last week we looked at the general perspective of the gifts, and we're going to start with the individual gifts in a minute. I'll give you the nine of them right now. And again, you're going to hear a lot of repetition. So individual spiritual gifts or manifestations were in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Number one, the gift of the word of wisdom. Or you could say the gift of the message of wisdom. It's a divine message from God. Gift number two, the gift of the word of knowledge. Or you could say the gift of the message of knowledge. Message from God. A divine, supernatural message. Gift number three, the gift of faith. Gift number four, the gifts of healing. Gift number five, the gift of the working of miracles. Remember, the work of the Holy Spirit. The working of miracles. The gift of prophecy is number six. Number seven, the gift of discerning of spirits. Or you could say distinguishing between spirits. Number eight, the gift of different kinds of tongues. And number nine, the gift of interpretation of tongues. This is, I would say, a companion gift. If there's tongues spoken in the assembly of the believers, and we'll get into this in more detail throughout this message, 
there needs to be an interpretation. Individual spiritual gifts or manifestations. I have to apologize because this teaching has been very lengthy and detailed, so I've got a lot of notes and I don't have a projector to have this up in front, so you're going to see me throughout looking down at my notes. I have to print them out at a font 14 so I can see them at 18 inches on this podium. Individual spiritual gifts or manifestations. Paul began chapter 12 in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. I myself have come across a lot of misunderstandings on what the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, how they're to be used, is there an order that needs to be in the church, the assembly of the saints, or the believers? So this verse is very appropriate. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now he's speaking to the church. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Verses 8 through 10, Paul is going to list varieties of gifts through the same Spirit. All gifts, these gifts, come through the same Spirit. So there's nine different gifts, but the same Spirit. Now listen very carefully. The same Spirit. What Spirit is this? There's some different terms for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, another Comforter. Jesus used that term in the Gospels. Even the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth that will exalt Jesus Christ, the Word of God. So listen carefully to this sentence. Paul lists varieties of gifts through the same Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, another Comforter, even the Spirit of Truth, as He wills. These gifts flow as the Holy Spirit wills. Who's He give them to? So if it's the Holy Spirit as He wills, that gives these gifts to a believer to give to another believer for their edification or for the assembly of the saints. The believers in the assembly, if they're given as He wills, it's important that we understand what it is that they're for. Though Paul does not define the characteristics of the gifts, we saw in the general perspective last week that if you, if you take the different words for those gifts used, you can see what the nature of the gifts are. So we can gather from other passages of Scripture what they would be, what they might be. Now here's some applicable Scripture references for you. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. That's from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 16, and I'll say 17a, the beginning of verse 17. How be it when he the Spirit of truth is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He shall show you things to come. The Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 13. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit 
for the common good of the whole body. Now, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And then for my own study notes, I put some things in parentheses, and this is where some of the repetition comes from that you need to hear. But to each one is given the supernatural manifestation of the Spirit, Spirit of God, for the common good of the whole body. Now let's take a look at gift number one. The gift of the Word or of the message of wisdom. Now why is this maybe listed number one? All of these gifts are important. We saw the definition of the word edification and that's what these are for. So, the, the, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher, some were given apostles, and some given prophets, and some given evangelists, and some given pastors and teachers for the, edifica- for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for their edification. That's why you're getting this teaching. You have to understand what these gifts are for. These are not just for the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and teacher. Those people need to operate in these gifts. They can't teach you how to operate. They can't teach you what these gifts really are and how to operate in them if they don't know how. So it's important. And and I'm not saying this to build myself up because the Bible says in verse 31 of chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians to desire the best gifts. I desire these gifts. The Bible says if you delight in God, He will give you the desires of your heart. The desires of my heart are these nine gifts to flow out of my belly as a river of living water so that I can fulfill what I've been called to do in the body of Christ. As a pastor, as a teacher, used as an evangelist, used with the gift of prophecy, because I have an apostolic calling on my life. I'm a sent one. When I get sent, I have to go edify the body of Christ. Now, the gift of the word of wisdom. Why is this important? Let's spend some time on wisdom. In 1 Kings, in the Old Testament, in chapter 3, verses 4 through 15, That's 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 4 for 15. This is Solomon's prayer for wisdom granted. God asked him what he wanted when he gave a sacrifice to God, and Solomon asked for an understanding heart that he could discern good and bad, to judge the good people that God made him the king over. He declared they were God's people and that he was simply an instrument of God to rule over them, and he asked for wisdom. And that pleased God. The Bible says that pleased God, so he blessed him exceeding and abundantly above what he asked for. In Proverbs 4, Verses 1 through 27, the whole proverb, you could sum up the command to obtain wisdom. It's a commandment by God to obtain wisdom. Proverbs 2, the whole proverb, verses 1 through 22, you could sum that up, the reward of wisdom. Proverbs 3, 
verses 1 through 35, the whole proverb speaks about the blessing of wisdom. So God gives a commandment to obtain wisdom, but with everything else that pertains to God, it all pertains to everything we need for life and godliness here in earth. It shouldn't surprise us that if God gives us a commandment to obtain wisdom, that there would be a reward of wisdom. It's a reward. The gift of the word or the message of wisdom. And it, there's a blessing, the blessing of wisdom. Now, two other things, and I'm going to give you some definitions here. In the book of Proverbs, the book's purpose is forthrightly stated in Proverbs 1, verses 2 through 7, to provide wisdom and understanding concerning wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. Now the wisdom of Proverbs finds its ultimate expression in Jesus Christ, the Word of God, in Jesus Christ. Someone greater than Solomon, you'll see that in Luke chapter 11, verse 31, who is made unto us wisdom, who is made unto us wisdom, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. The gift of the word of wisdom, the divine supernatural gift or manifestation of the word of the message of wisdom. The word of wisdom is a wise utterance spoken through the operation of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God, another comforter, even the Spirit of Truth. It applies the revelation of God's Word or the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, another comforter, even the Spirit of Truth, to a specific problem or situation. And you can see this in the book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 10, chapter 15, verses 13 through 22. Now, this is a divine message spoken by God, given by God to a believer, either for another believer or another group of believers or the whole assembly of saints. It is not, however, the same as having the wisdom of God for daily living. So we have to separate this out. The latter is obtained by what? By di this is, where does the wisdom for your daily living come from? The Word of God. By diligent reading and study and meditation on the ways and Word of God and by prayer. You can see James chapter 1, verses 5 to 6. Again, remember the opening prayer. Father, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is the Word of God. So we're seeing in these various definitions from various sources and the scriptures, the importance of wisdom. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is the will of God, and the will of God is the wisdom of God. 
So if I was standing up here and someone came up to me this evening for prayer and they needed wisdom, I could quote a scripture from the Word of God if it applied to their daily living. But what I'm really going to wait for is the Holy Spirit. Because if there's a problem or a circumstance they need wisdom for, and they haven't seen it yet, and they've come to another believer, I want the Holy Spirit, I want to be submitted to the Holy Spirit that the word or the message of wisdom comes through the working of the Holy Spirit for that person. Remember, this is a divine, supernatural manifestation. Now, I had somebody come up for prayer to me after our service on Sunday, and they, they had several questions for me, and the answers were all pertaining to wisdom. They needed wisdom in three different specific things happening in their life, and, they, and, they, and, and, and or clarity or confirmation. And I waited for the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit spoke. The wisdom of God came out. And that person was edified. They were lifted up. They were gained knowledge. It was a message, a divine message from God that came out of me. We, we have to understand this. The gift to make choices, listen very carefully, because I'm going to give you a very lengthy definition in a minute. It's the gift or the supernatural manifestation to help make choices and give leadership that is according to the will of God. And to give leadership, that is in accordance to the will of God. Now in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, Paul, this is Paul's prayer for spiritual understanding. So go back and listen to this message and get a hold of these scriptures, verses 15 through 23, but verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the Word of God. Proverbs, referred to as the book of wisdom, the purpose was to provide wisdom and understanding concerning wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. We see that in verse 2 and 3. Proverb 1. Now Noah Webster, 1828 American Dictionary of the English Language, the word wisdom. Noah Webster was asked to write a dictionary. There were many immigrants that came to America and there were different variations of the English language as, as these immigrants learned English. So he was asked to compile a dictionary of an American dictionary of the English language. That's the title of it. But he would not write that dictionary unless he could use scriptures as the examples for the definitions. Now I learned from Noah Webster looking up words in that dictionary and I, I similarly teach along those lines a lot. I will read the material what God lays on my heart, puts in my heart, study it. So I'm, I'm doing the diligent reading, study and meditation on the Word of God, and then 
you could you could get bullet points from that like you've been given this evening but they have to be backed up the substance has to be from the scriptures so wisdom six different definitions Number one, the right use or exercise of knowledge. So you have knowledge or information. Remember verse one that Paul wrote. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not, I do not you to be ignorant the right use or exercise of knowledge. That's what we're learning over these two weeks. What are these gifts? What? So you have the knowledge, you're getting the knowledge, and you're also learning the right use of that. The right use or exercise of knowledge, the choice of laudable ends, and of the best means to accomplish them. The best means to accomplish an end. This is wisdom in act, effect, or practice. If wisdom is to be considered as a faculty of the mind, it is the faculty of discerning or judging what is most just, proper, and useful and if it is to be considered as an acquirement, it is the knowledge and use of what is best, most just, most proper, most conducive to prosperity or happiness. Now I can sum most of this up and tell you, go to Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. Wisdom in the first sense, or practical wisdom, is nearly synonymous with discretion. You're going to see another gift later called discerning of spirits. It differs somewhat from prudence in this respect. Prudence is the exercise of sound judgment in avoiding evils. Wisdom is the exercise of sound judgment either in avoiding evils or attempting good. Remember what Solomon asked for, an understanding heart to discern good and bad, that he could judge the good people that God made him king over, God's good people. Prudence, then, is a species of which wisdom is the genus. Now, wisdom gained by experience is of inestimable value. We should not make the same mistakes over and over and over again. We should learn. Wisdom should come from our experience. Now, I'm going to give you an example. When I was a little boy, my dad took me over his youngest brother's house, my Uncle Bobby, and my cousin Robert and I usually would play in his bedroom. Now, on, on a particular day, Robert had one of my uncle's truck keys in his hand. And my Uncle Bob went up to him and said, Son, do not stick this key or anything else in one of these electrical sockets in the wall. And he left the room. So Robert and I continued to play. It got late. My dad left. We get home. Sometime after we left, my cousin Robert took that key. Now, he was given knowledge from my uncle, from his dad, but he didn't he didn't take heed to it. He did the complete opposite. He stuck that metal key in that electrical socket, and my uncle's explanation of what happened, there a, was a burn mark on the wall. The key 
exploded in his hand and my cousin got thrown across the bedroom and hit the wall. That was an experience that my cousin Robert used wisdom on. He never did that again. Now, if your decisions and your choices, it could be anything. It could be with your finances, how you spend your money. It could be some addiction. It could be the people that you invite to your house to come and live in your home. If you've had a bad experience, are you repeating this over and over and over again, or have you learned your lesson? This is what wisdom is for. Now this is continuing from Noah Webster. It is hoped that our rulers, our leaders, will act with dignity and wisdom, that they will yield everything to reason and refuse everything to force. Are you quick to listen and slow to speak? Or do you do what the world says and engage your mouth before your mind? The world would say you put your foot in your mouth. You got yourself in trouble. You didn't use wisdom. You just spoke out. Are you the kind of person when somebody's speaking to you that you're actually listening to what they're saying or did you just hear something you want to respond to because you have to do all the talking and you don't like it when they talk? Most of the time your response is going to have nothing to do with wisdom because you didn't let that person finish speaking. You were thinking about what you were going to say when they spoke the first sentence and therefore what you spoke out of your mouth had nothing to do with the context or the content, the intent of what they were trying to say to you. I used to get frustrated because there's people in my life that do that all the time. But I got delivered from that, so now I, what wisdom told me is not to hang out with that type of person all the time. Because I'm not going to be able to accomplish what I want to do what I need to do, what I've been tasked to do. And if, if that person is somebody that I need to communicate with, let's say four or five different things, it could be a spouse in your, you could be married, it could be your spouse, this person could be your boss, this person could be a friend of yours. And you need to communicate some things to them and you can never get through that list because they just keep doing all the talking. So you're trying to get an answer out of them and you can't get, you can't get the answer to your first question out of six because by the time they get done speaking, they never answered your question in the first place. And then they say, oh, I'm busy. I can't, the time's gotten away from me and they scurry off. I have to use wisdom when I'm going to approach that person and I need the wisdom of God because I need to get information from them. And if I can't get the information from them, I can't do what maybe I could do because I have the skills to do something to help that person or to help that ministry, to help that organization but I, can't, I could be their best resource and the least used person because that person needs information and they can never get it from them. So we have to be careful. We need wisdom. Definition number two. Now all of number one pertain to Holy Scriptures. We saw that in the beginning. 
That's why you were given all these scriptures up front. But number two, Noah Webster wrote, In scripture, human learning, erudition, knowledge of arts and sciences. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Acts chapter 7, verse 22. There's knowledge, information. Remember, wisdom is the right use of that knowledge. They should be tied hand in hand. The opposite of wisdom would be foolishness. So if you're repeating the same mistakes all the time, You're not using wisdom. It's foolishness. You have not learned yet to not do what it is you're doing. And a lot of times, because we have the flesh versus the spirit, the flesh will convince that person that there was a benefit, there was some benefit in the decision that they made when, it, when the outcome went bad. When the outcome went bad, they will convince themselves of the little bit of a benefit. Now, why would that be? Because there's varying degrees of the outcome. Wisdom is the right use of that knowledge, the most beneficial use. So if we as the body of Christ is to be used by God, by the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Ghost, the manifestations of these gifts, is God always going to give wisdom to the person that usually makes the same mistakes, foolishness all the time? I don't know. That's just a rhetorical question. Definition number three, quickness quickness of intellect, readiness of apprehension, and dexterity in execution, as the wisdom of Bezali, I can't pronounce it, Bezalel and Aholib, Exodus chapter 31, verse 2 and 6. Quickness of intellect, wisdom Quickness of intellect, readiness to apprehend, and dexterity in execution. So if I'm using wisdom, I can take the information that I had, apprehend it quickly, and come up with an answer very quickly. That's what wisdom does. So that man that came up and asked me those questions... I prayed before the service for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus. And I tell the Lord every day, I desire the gifts of the Holy Ghost. So he manifested wisdom. That's what that believer needed. It was a problem and certain circumstances going on in their life. They'd made certain decisions and they came up for to ask questions, to get confirmation. So what happened, because God, it was God's wisdom, they were edified. They were lifted up. They got confirmation that in that circumstance, one of them happening in their lives, that they did make the correct decision. Definition number four, natural instinct and sagacity. Natural instinct. Job chapter 39, you'll see that. Natural instinct. That means that if I, if I was quick, if I exhibited quickness of intellect, readiness of apprehension, and dexterity in execution... That means that wisdom can flow out of me as a natural instinct 
Just like if I sat in the chair over there and took a rubber hammer, crossed my leg and hit what they call your funny bone in your knee, and your, your leg goes like this. It's a natural instinct. It's a reflex. That's what wisdom is going to be. You don't want your reflexiveness in your life to be foolishness all the time. You know, if I go out on the highway and it's a 25 mile an hour speed limit and I race and I get pulled over by a law enforcement officer, whose fault was that? I broke the law. If God has mercy on me, if I don't challenge the authority of that officer for simply doing his job, and I don't have a bad attitude, and I don't start remembering things in my past to where my behavior is going to show that person that I have a problem with authority. I don't like people to tell me what to do. I have an authority problem, an authority issue. An issue with authority, maybe I won't get the ticket. But if I continue to do that again the next day and I get pulled over again, same law enforcement officer, same street, I should have learned by now that the law enforcement in that particular area are there for a reason there's a 25 mile an hour speed limit and I could make an assumption at that point that probably a lot of people that lived on either side of that road wanted the traffic to slow down for their own safety. It's a safety issue. So I get pulled over a second time and the officer says, sir, I thought you, you know, what am I going to do with you? And he gives me a ticket. The next day, I'm in a hurry, I drive down that road, same law enforcement officer. I get pulled over, same outcome, except the fine gets increased. If I keep doing that, I'm going to lose my license. That's the ultimate outcome. I was foolish. I repeated the same decision-making process and the same behavior through that decision-making process where the result, the end result, is the same over and over and over and over again. I'm being foolish. I'm not using wisdom. Definition number five. In Scripture theology, wisdom is true religion. Godliness piety, remember we said all things that pertain to life and godliness, the knowledge and fear of God, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and sincere and uniform obedience to God's commands. This is the wisdom which is from above. Psalm 90 and Job 28, chapter 28. And the last definition, number six, profitable words of doctrine. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. Profitable words of doctrine. Psalm 37 and 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, conviction, correction, and instruction in righteousness. All Scripture. Noah Webster writes, Wisdom, the definition of wisdom, one of them is profitable words of doctrine. The wisdom of this world Mere human wisdom or the carnal policy of men, their craft and artifices in promoting their temporal interests called also fleshly wisdom. If you're not 
quick to listen and slow to speak. If you make quick decisions, you know, my dad sometimes would say, son, don't shoot from the hip. That's fleshly wisdom, carnal wisdom. And you can tell from the outcome. What was the consequence of your decision? Did that have a negative impact on yourself and those people around you? Did it have a negative impact if you're a manager, a leader at work? on the people that are underneath you? Did it impact that business's profitability? Was there a lot of money spent and a lot of time, resources of people's effort put into things, but you didn't use wisdom? You just went and did it? These are the things that, that, that we have to learn from. Hopefully we learn from those things. The wisdom of words, artificial or affected eloquence, or learning, learning displayed in teaching. 1 Corinthians, verse 1 and 2. Now, I'm almost out of time, and I knew that most of this lesson was going to be on wisdom because the rest of it's going to flow out of this. Um, we have time to go through the second gift. The gift of the word of knowledge or the gift of the message of knowledge. Message, divine message from God. This is not just you speaking with fleshly knowledge, fleshly wisdom, carnal knowledge, carnal wisdom, not using the right use of the knowledge this is God. Now, God cannot lie. God is never wrong. So this gift, the gift of wisdom, is very important for the edification, for the knowledge, the lifting up of the body of Christ, of the assembly of saints, or your family or yourself individually. And so is this, knowledge. It's a divine, supernatural gift or manifestation of the word of knowledge or of the message of knowledge. The word of knowledge is an utterance. It's an utterance inspired by the Holy Spirit. Again, the Spirit of God, another comforter, even the Spirit of truth that reveals knowledge about people circumstances, or biblical truth. It is often connected closely with prophecy. And then see Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, chapter 10, verses 47 through 48, chapter 15, verses 7 through 11, and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 24 through 25. So it's the supernatural gift or manifestation, an utterance inspired by the Holy Spirit to comprehensively or completely understand a spiritual issue or circumstance. Now, the next part of this, before I close, this comes from the Matthew Henry commentary on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, specifically, he's, he's speaking specifically on the word of knowledge. And I'm going to quote him. This is a quote from Matthew Henry. To another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit. That is, now this is Matthew Henry, say some the knowledge of mysteries. Chapter 2, verse 13, wrapped up in the prophecies, types, and histories of the Old Testament. And then say others, a skill and readiness 
to give advice and counsel in perplexed cases, complicated cases. Wisdom is the correct use of this knowledge. So if knowledge, if Pastor Pete has a skill and readiness to give advice and counsel in perplexed or complicated cases, if the Holy Spirit gives me that word, that knowledge, and I can speak it out quickly, and that is in combination with wisdom, I used Wisdom was the correct use of this. Remember to apprehend these two gifts. This is the power and glory manifested of God. God said, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So would we not want to use or be a vessel for these gifts to flow through us? The gift of the word of wisdom and the gift of the word of knowledge can be given to Pastor Pete, a believer, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit for myself, for my own edification, for my own comfort, for my own uplifting, for my own learning. Because it's from God. Remember, These are divine gifts or manifestations of the power and glory of God. It's God's power and glory on display through inspiration inspired by the Holy Spirit, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. Even the Spirit of Truth another comforter, the Spirit of God. And I'll close on that. Next Wednesday, we're going to pick up, I would encourage you to go back and re, or look at the last three weeks of messages and this one, and this will take another week. We'll go through the last of the seven of these gifts. Father, we thank You for Your words of truth, for Your word is wisdom, the wisdom of God. And I thank You that this message will not return void. Father, I ask for a divine hunger and thirst to come upon all of us, as every message that You give to me is for myself, for my edification, and then You you inspire me to go out and teach your gift of teaching to the body of Christ, which I enjoy to do, so I thank you. I thank you that you used me to give this message, that you blessed me to be able to do that. You blessed me all week as I studied. Lord, I pray that all of our eyes are open, that the Word of God is a blessing given from heaven for us for everything that pertains to life and godliness. All the blessings are there. And Blessed is the God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Father, we thank You. We bless You tonight. We love You. Lord, we thank You. In the name of Jesus, amen.